Good morning, afternoon, or evening. I know we have people from all over the world and we're very thankful for you um, to join us today and share information and, and hear the great lineup that we have for session two of this webinar. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the coordinator for the National Wildlife Disease Program in APHIS Wildlife Services, and I'm here to serve as your moderator today for day two. So I really wanted to recap what we did on day one and set the stage for, for where we're going. Uh, so if you were not available um, yesterday, uh, we'll have a recording for this, but the um, great information that we received um, started off as an introduction of why highly pathogenic avian influenza is a concern for our wild bird managers in North America. And that was from Dr. Camille Hopkins from the USGS. And then a brief overview of the global situation going on currently with HPAI, again from the USGS National Wildlife Health Center with Dr. Jonathan Sleeman. And then we were given more details going into specifics in our update from Asia, from um, Yoshishiro, Dakota. And then from Yosan um, Verhagen, I hope I pronounced that right, with an update from Europe. Um, and then we got into some specifics on some scientific research, understanding the infectivity of contemporary highly pathogenic avian influenza, and specifically in our waterfowl host from Dr. Patton Jackwood. And then Andy Rainey um, finished us up yesterday, really looking at that um, flyway, that, that breeding ground, and the specifics of dispersal of the viruses, and the importance of understanding what's going on in Alaska, because we've got that key overlap there between what's going on in Asia and what can be coming down into our North American flyways. Um, from Andy Rainey, again, from the United States Geologic Survey. So great conversations yesterday, and that scientific work um, I see a pop up. Yes, was yesterday's session recorded? Yes, all of the sessions will be recorded and will be posted later. And I'll get the information for that um, in the chat, and we'll figure out how to how to move that forward. Um, but the questions that came up at the end, um, Jonathan Sleeman was um, the moderator yesterday, and some great conversations going on, understanding what we're doing with this information, why surveillance is important. Um, what technologies we can look at to make improvements for the surveillance, um, a great side discussion on what early warning really means. There's, there's not really a, a fleshed out um, definition of how early, early, um, early warning is and what we can do with that, relaying that information to our production and industry partners, giving them a chance to increase their biosecurity, but making sure that whatever we're calling near real time or real time or early warning um, is sufficient and that information is being shared fast enough to, to make actions. That of course is the goal of any surveillance system is to provide actions and, and give um, time for our, our partners to do something. Really understanding what we need to provide to our poultry industry and stakeholders, what's of value to them, and then making sure that we're doing our best to connect research needs and ongoing and future research to what our managers and senior leaders need to understand and that we can take appropriate actions there. So excellent discussion yesterday, and today we're moving forward into some more granular details on what we all know um, was one of the most um, catastrophic and difficult um, outbreaks that the USDA and United States government has ever dealt with in the 2014-2015 high path avian influenza outbreak. So just kind of kicking us off as to where we're going for session two, again, it's a lot of lessons learned today from our United States and Canadian partners, so looking at this as a North American scale. Um, and session two is going to begin, and I'm proud to introduce one of my coworkers, Dr. Tom DiLiberto. Um, Tom um, has earned his, uh, is a wildlife biologist and a veterinarian. He's conducted research on a variety of emerging and re-emerging diseases, such as rabies, bovine tuberculosis, brucellosis, avian influenza, plague, salmonellosis, and COVID-19. And he currently serves as an assistant director at the National Wildlife Research Center, where he coordinates wildlife services research on rabies, foodborne pathogen, and emerging diseases. And he also serves with me on the interagency wild bird highly pathogenic steering committee. And with that, I'm happy to introduce it over to Tom DiLiberto. Um, Tom, let's make sure your audio and visual, I see your slides up, let's do an audio check for you. How about now? You got it. There you go, sir. Uh, take it Thanks. away. 
Thank you, Julie, and hello, everyone. Um, this talk primarily summarizes a review paper that my co-authors and I published in Virology in 2018 about lessons learned from research and surveillance on avian influenza in wild birds. As such, I'd like to thank them for their contributions on these products, especially Dr. Andy Ramey, who developed the majority of this presentation. Additionally, the products I will summarize today represent the efforts of numerous scientists that have conducted research and surveillance directed towards highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses in wild birds. So thank you all for your contributions to our understanding of the ecology of avian influenza in wild birds. Finally, much of this presentation will touch on topics addressed in yesterday's presentations and discussions, and I think it will resonate with many of you that were involved with the research and surveillance of high path H5N8 and H5N2 during 2014 and 2016. So prior to 20, 2002, there had only been a single detection of a high path influenza A virus in wild birds, specifically in terns in South Africa in 1961. However, the emergence of the goose guandong highly pathogenic H5N1 virus in China during the mid-1990s turned much of what we, knew, what we knew at the time about avian influenza in wild birds on its head. Subsequent outbreaks of this high path H5N1 virus associated with free-ranging aquatic birds in Hong Kong in 2002 and China in 2005 led many to wonder whether this virus could be dispersed long distances by migratory birds. Thus, the intensity of sampling of wild birds for influenza A viruses increased throughout North America, with many surveillance programs being directed towards the early detection of foreign origin viruses. This dramatic increase in research and surveillance for high path H5N1 and other viruses in North America brings us to the first of our lessons learned. Specifically, we, know, we now know that wild birds disperse avian influenza viruses between North America and adjacent regions via migration. Using a variety of marking techniques, ornithologists have demonstrated that numerous wild bird hosts of influenza viruses have intercontinental migratory tendencies including northern pintail ducks and emperor geese. However, it wasn't until recently, uh, it was, it was, uh, it wasn't uh, until recently, it was really unclear if these species were dispersing viruses between continents via migration. So in 2008, Kohler et al. provided evidence that a relatively high proportion of influenza vir A viruses from northern pintails sampled in Alaska had Eurasian lineage gene segments. Numerous follow-up investigations provided support for the dilution by distance of these Eurasian gene segments within the Pacific Flyway of North America. That is, Eurasian lineage gene segments are common in viruses obtained from wild birds in western Alaska near the North American East Asian Flyways interface, and they're less common at areas further south and east in North America. Now, this supports the hypothesis that Western Alaska is a point of entry for foreign, foreign origin viruses into North America via, via migratory birds. For example, Ramey et al. in 2011 detected an H9N2 genome constellation in a northern pintail and an emperor goose sampled in western, western Alaska. That, had, um, th that detection had also, th that virus had also been detected in wild birds in China and South Korea. Now, more recently, an entire, entirely Eurasian lineage H8N4 genome constellation in a northern pin pintail duck sampled in western Alaska was identified. We also have evidence for other pathways by which wild birds may potentially introduce avian influenza viruses into North America. 
Andrew Lang's group in Newfoundland has provided evidence that seabirds, such as gulls and mures, may facilitate viral dispersal via, North, via the North Atlantic pathway. Their efforts also included the identification of the first entirely Eurasian lineage genome constellation detected in North America. And although less intensively studied, evidence suggests that neotropical migrants, such as blue-winged teal, may disperse influenza A viruses between North America and the northern neotropics. However, geographic barriers, such as the Amazon Basin and Andes Cordillera, may limit the dispersal of viruses by wild birds from southeastern South America to the United States and Canada. <clears throat> Evidence for the intercontinental dispersal of avian influenza by wild birds sets up our second lesson learned. More specifically, that high path viruses may be introduced to wild birds in North America. In late 2014, clade 2344 high path avian influenza began to, periodic, to be periodically detected among both wild and domestic birds in the Pacific flyway of the US and Canada. Given contemporaneous detections of clade 2344 viruses in wild birds in Eurasia, the working hypothesis was and continues to be that wild birds introduced high path viruses into North America via trans Beringian pathway. So during, during the ensuing seven months, high path viruses continue to affect both wild and domestic birds in North America. Clade 2344 viruses were detected in roughly 1% of wild bird samples screened as part of active surveillance during the waterfowl hunting season in the western U.S. Genomic characterization of isolates provided evidence that high path viruses were reassorting with low path viruses maintained in, in the wild bird reservoir. Thus, the introduction of high path viruses into wild birds and apparent circulation in those species during this time period represented an unprecedented event in North America. Which brings us to lesson three. Based on research and surveillance conducted during the 2014-15 outbreak and the 2017-87-N8 outbreak in turkeys in Indiana, we now have evidence that high path viruses can cross the wild bird poultry interface in North America. Support for the sp for spread across the interface is provided through inferred phylogenetic relationships among viral genomes suggestive of spillover events and by epidemiological analyses supporting indirect contact between wild and domestic birds. Transmission of high path viruses across the wild, wild bird poultry interface is not unprecedented from a global perspective, particularly for goose guandong lineage viruses. However, the spread of high path viruses between wild and domestic birds represents another unprecedented event in North America. And it suggests that biosecurity practices in place at the time were not sufficient to prevent economically costly viruses from spreading between wild and domestic birds, even once such pathogens had been identified through national and international surveillance programs. The spillover of clade 2344 viruses may be at least partially a function of the increased infectivity of these viruses in waterfowl, which may be explained by the evolution of goose guandong lineage viruses through serial infections in poultry and domestic waterfowl over about two decades. However, a recent laboratory study also found that other high path viruses associated with poultry outbreaks were infectious in mallards, replicating in various tissues to relatively high titers were shed both via the oral pharynx and the cloaca and caused few clinical signs. Thus, the introduction of a, of a diversity of high path viruses from poultry to waterfowl appears to be biologically possible, 
but insufficient or non-sustained exposure of wild birds may prevent infection. Therefore, enhanced biosecurity and containment of high path outbreaks in poultry is also important in preventing spillover to wild birds and limiting virus spread. Our fourth lesson learned is the notion that probability of encountering and detecting a specific virus through wild bird surveillance may be relatively low. For example, let's consider research and surveillance efforts surrounding the 2014-15 outbreak of high path viruses in North America. The best available data suggests that clade 2344 viruses were introduced from East Asia via migratory birds, yet such viruses were not detected in Alaska during late summer and autumn of 2014, despite targeted surveillance of wild birds in Western Alaska and other parts of the state. Perhaps more importantly, following the apparent eradication of these Guangdong high path viruses from North American poultry in June of 2015, there were four additional detection of those viruses in wild birds in the subsequent two years through screening of more than 80,000 samples in the U.S. Now, when we consider genomic data derived from the high path H5N2 viruses recovered from a mallard, wild mallard sampled in Alaska in August of 2016, more than one year after the, the last detection in North American poultry, we find evidence for substantial genetic drift as compared to the most closely related isolates recovered during the 2014-15 outbreak. Thus, the continued circulation of high path viruses among a very large population of North American waterfowl at extremely low prevalence following eradication in poultry may be a likely explanation for this finding. Our fifth lesson learned is that population immunity of wild birds may influence high path AI outbreaks in North American um, it outbreaks in North America. More specifically, population immunity of wild birds could influence the maintenance of low path H5 and H7 subtype viruses, which have the potential to develop into high path, high path viruses in poultry. Or it may influence the maintenance and dispersal of high path viruses introduced into wild birds as occurred during the 2014-15 outbreak. Laboratory challenge studies provide evidence that infection of waterfowl with influenza A viruses may provide partial or complete immunity to birds for viruses of the same or different hemagglutinin subtypes. While complete protective immunity precludes subsequent infection, partial protective immunity may influence the duration of infection and viral shedding patterns. Thus, population immunity of wild birds may influence the space and time at which low path H5 and H7 sub, H7 subtypes may be most prevalent in the population. And therefore, the relative risk of the introduction into poultry systems where there is spatiotemporal overlap. Laboratory challenge studies also provide evidence that prior infection with low path viruses may influence immunity of waterfowl to high path viruses. For example, prior infection of waterfowl with low path viruses could reduce the duration or magnitude of viral shedding during infection with high path viruses, thereby reducing the risk of transmission among sympatric birds. Alternatively, protect Partial protective immunity could promote the survival of birds infected with high path viruses, thereby facilitating virus dispersal. Finally, our last lesson learned is that productive, uh, a proactive disease surveillance empowers agencies, producers, and stakeholders. This is true for any disease, whether it's bovine tuberculosis, chronic wasting disease, white nose syndrome, SARS, or avian influenza. In the case of the 2014-15 H5N8 and H5N2 outbreak, 
we did not have an adequate wild bird surveillance system in place prior to the detection in poultry in British Columbia. Once detected, um, once that detection did occur in Canada, localized surveillance across the border in Washington was quickly established, and subsequent surveillance began throughout the Pacific Flyway. While that surveillance was effective at describing the extent of infection in wild birds throughout the flyway, we had already missed the movement of the virus associated with the migration of wild birds, and were unable to provide early warning to policymakers, producers, stakeholders, and the public. Even after we documented the introduction of high path avian influenza in the Pacific Flyway, we did not stand up active surveillance in the other flyways. Consequently, we did not identify movement of the viruses in the Central and Mississippi Flyways prior to the introduction of the viruses in poultry. Now, whether such proactive surveillance could have minimized the impacts of, of the 2015 outbreaks in poultry um, is, is not really known. We have no idea of knowing that. But what we do know is that the lack of early warning through wild bird surveillance left producers, stakeholders, and the public surprised and unprepared as the viruses were detected uh, throughout the Pacific Central and Mississippi flyways of the U.S. In conclusion, research and surveillance directed towards high-path AIVs and wild birds inhabiting North America provides us with numerous lessons which may help to guide future research and surveillance activities. They may also inform biosecurity practices and elucidate risks associated with the viruses circulating among wild birds. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll leave you with this last slide of um, areas of future research that may lead to additional important uh, lessons learned in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. A great conversation and some great kernels of information for us to um, for us to discuss. I uh, just wanted to um, have a, we have a little bit of time um, for discussion. If you're on the WebEx. On the bottom right-hand um, corner, if you wiggle your mouse around, there is a chat feature um, on the very bottom right. It's kind of a blue button with a thought bubble next to it. If you have any um, thoughts or questions, I'd be happy to, to bring those up for discussion now. Um, we're going to save verbal questions until the end and um, ask all of our speakers to stay on for the panel for the last hour. Um, Tom, while we're giving folks a chance to put anything in the chat, I just wanted to um, see if you can expand a little bit um, your thoughts on the um, population immunity and partial protective immunity in wild birds and the risk. Um, very interesting thoughts, and, and I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit more on what you think that might mean for what we're looking at today with what we know on the um, Asian and UK um, risks that might be coming in, you know, with a little bit of the changes there, do you feel like we've got the same situation brewing or just keep an eye out for things? Yeah, um, I, I think from, from my own standpoint, the population immunity in wild birds is, is one of the most um, interesting topics um, and probably one of the topics while well, we've learned a lot on, probably we need a lot more uh, knowledge on. Um, we, we have some really good research that that uh, demonstrates some of the, um, you know, influence of of direct of complete uh, immunity from uh, to various viruses of animals that were affected with one individual virus. But getting that whole picture of whether it's even possible to get the whole picture of how the very the the, the large number of, of viruses that are circulating in wild birds might impact either other viruses, the, uh, the ability of other viruses to infect wild birds, or even um, new emerging viruses. I think that's kind of one of the areas that's really the frontier for us in, in wildlife, the, this concept of um, full and partial immunity in wild birds and relative to influenza viruses. So I, I basically did not answer your question because I don't know the answer to how it might affect um, uh, uh, the viruses that are circulating in um, Eurasia now if they were to come into the U.S. 
Well, yeah, it, uh, agree. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to answer it. It's, it's a tough one. <laughs> All right, Tom, great. Thank you very much for, for the lessons learned. Oh, I do have one more question coming in um, from the chat. It says, Tom, thank you for the great talk. Can you expand more on the role of the North American wetlands in the maintenance of avian influenza virus? Do wetlands in America, change, have they changed a lot in the last 30 years and do we anticipate changes in the wetlands kind of coming in the future? Yeah, really great question. Um, the wetlands um, in North America have changed dramatically in the last, I think the time period was the 30 years. Um, they've changed dramatically. Um, and I, um, I think everyone probably envisions that that change could continue as we move uh, into the future. Um, that in, in the past 30 years, a lot of that has been through human development and reduction of, of um, wetlands, although we do now in the U.S. have um, some laws um, per, um, that um, protect wetlands, um, but I think much of the loss of wetlands occurred earlier on um, before some of those um, uh, laws and regulations were in place. Um, now we're dealing with um, uh, uh, severe drought um, in many parts of the country and climate change issues. I, I think that um, wetlands will be, uh, the change in wetlands will, will continue uh, and we'll see dramatic changes. I think some of the more recent research by Dr. Ramey up at, um, in Alaska on, um, the, on how influenza viruses are maintained in our wetlands there's also, um, you know, some very interesting research that we really need to uh, continue. Um, understanding that from the low pass situation, the, the cycle of influenza in wild birds is, is probably primarily a, a fecal oral um, route, and persistence in wetlands may account for some of the continued circulation of the viruses in wild birds. So it's a very complex I think dynamic that's going to change very rapidly in the next few years. Thank you for that, Tom. And in the interest of time, we have more questions coming in from the chat, and I'm going to hold those for a little bit until we get to our panel discussion. Um, so, Dr. DiLiberto, thank you very much. Um, getting ready to switch over to Dr. Han mm -hmm. Ip um, with the USGS National Wildlife Health Center. Um, Dr. Ip is a research scientist that um, directs the Diagnostic Laboratory for the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin. Dr. Ip is also one of my mom's favorite people in the world, <laughs> as a side note. Um, it was his laboratory that detected the introduction of highly pathogenic avian influenza into the United States. His lab recently focuses on coronaviruses and wildlife, including experimental and surveillance program for SARS-CoV-2. And he and the team at the National Wildlife Health Center published over 80 papers on wildlife viral diseases. Um, Dr. Ip, I see your slides up. Let's do a quick audio check. Okay, can you hear me? You're good to go, hon. Take it away. All right, good. So first I want to start by thanking the organizers uh, for the invitation to participate in this meeting. The USGS experience with the 2014-2015 high path virus incursion began with a story. Oops, my slides are not moving. If you can, there oh, you go. There we go. Thank you. Um, where the story of a small lake, a private balconer, a thinking wildlife biologist. Wiser Lake is in Whatcom County, Washington, and is directly south of the Canadian town of Abbotsford, British Columbia. I think the next two talks after mine will describe this in more detail, but Abbotsford and the Fraser River Valley is one of the largest concentration of poultry operations in Canada. And in early December 2014, there was indications of an avian influenza outbreak on some farm in Abbotsford. On Monday, December 8th, Paul DeBrun, the wildlife biologist in the state of Washington, observed a small-scale wild bird mortality event on Weiser Lake. The next day, as the mortality event continued, Paul picked up 63 waterfowl carcasses and sent 13 of them to the National Wildlife Health Center for postmortem investigation. 
We tested the birds on Wednesday, found avian influenza in eight out of the 13 birds, and the H5 subtype in two, a northern pintail and a mallard. We forwarded those samples to NDSL that night, and on Thursday, NDSL confirmed our initial test results, and they set up sequencing for the H5 gene over that night. By Friday, NDSL called to say that the preliminary sequence information suggested that the H5 gene in the pintail was similar to the HPAI H5N8 virus that was circulating in Asia and Europe that year. And even though it was now the weekend, phone calls and messages were sent to alert state, ag, and wildlife agencies, as well as poultry producers, that an H introduction of high path H5 viruses had occurred and that it might be spreading by wild birds. So one of the comments yesterday was how early is early detection and what are the signals that would that will change action. In our example, within two days after the laboratory has received samples, messages went out. Over that weekend, NDSL completed the whole genome sequencing of the virus and to our surprise, found that it was a H5N2 virus and it was a reassortment of the Eurasian H5N8 and the North American wild bird low path avian influenza virus. I should note here that our pathologist at the National Wildlife Health Center said that the birds most likely died of aspergillosis and not from the high path H AI infection. This suggested that the waterfowl might be less susceptible to the virus, a point later supported by data from direct ex experimental infections such as those from Dr. Penton Jackwood that we heard from yesterday. Now, if we take a step back, at a location less than 10 miles away um, from Lake Weiser on Sunday, a day before the mortality event on Weiser Lake was first noticed, a falconer took his deer falcon Lysander hunting. That day, she caught and set off for a time on an American widgeon. A day later on Monday, the same day that birds were picked up at Weiser Lake and being was shipped to USGS, the same Widgeon, parts of that widgeon was fed to three other falcons in the same uh, aviary collection. Lysander died a day later. Now, because Paul de Bruyne, the wildlife biologist, knew the falconer, when he heard about the sudden death of Lysander, he urged that Lysander be submitted to USGS for postmortem investigation. On Thursday, the three other birds that have worked uh, that that widgeon sample also were so sick that they had to be euthanized. By Friday, we confirmed that multiple tissues in Lysander were indeed infected with the H5 virus. And over the weekend, USDA confirmed that the Lysander was infected with um, the high path H5 virus and whole genome sequencing was also underway that first weekend. By Wednesday, December 17th, NDSL has identified that the Lysander was infected with the H5N8 virus. All eight RNA segments, as you well know now, were directly from um, the Eurasian virus that was introduced intact into North America. So essentially, within a week, we showed that there was an introduction of a wholly Eurasian high path AI virus into North America, that there was evidence of wild bird involvement that waterfowl might be significantly less susceptible than raptors and that the virus was changing and recombining with North American wild bird avian influenza viruses. And as we headed into Christmas and New Year in 2014, plans were formulated at USGS and USDA to develop a surveillance program to determine the extent of wild bird involvement in this high path AI incursion. I think about the 2014-2015 incursion in two phases, the first lasting between December and February. During this period, as shown by the bar chart to the right, 47 detections were in wild birds, here highlighted in green, and with only 11 events in poultry, colored in purple. Among the poultry events, nine were in backyard flocks, which might be assumed to have a lower biosecurity and hence a greater risk to exposure to wild birds. And I like to think that the early warning that was given at this time helped in some way to protect 
the billion plus dollar poultry industry in California and limited the number of commercial outbreaks that affected to just three sites. During the first phase of the incursion, we sampled um, 1,231 apparently healthy wild birds and found 14% of them were positive for avian influenza viruses. 1.7% of the birds were also positive for H5. And of note, this is nearly three times the historic average of uh, less of 0.46% of H5 that is usually found in wild birds. What's more surprising is the proportion of the hunter harvested birds carrying the HPAI H5 gene, which is 0.8%. So this means that at this time, nearly one in every 100 birds were carrying the high path AI virus. I forgot who yesterday um, who brought up the issue of how surveillance program comes and goes. And as Tom just mentioned, at the start of this outbreak, our path of surveillance program was one of the few, perhaps only, national surveillance program looking at avian influenza in wild birds. From 536 birds, sick or dying birds, we detected about the same proportion of avian influenza viruses. But look at the H5 detection rate and more importantly, the high path H5 detection rate. At, the, at this period of time, something like 3.4% of the birds um, in a passive mortality surveillance program were positive for the high path H5 virus. In fact, we found nearly twice as many high path H5s from dead birds while sampling nearly only less than half of the number of birds that we did in the active surveillance program. The passive program also showed that the majority, seven out of the 11 species that was uh, H5, high path H5 positive were from raptors. They're highlighted in bold, indicating that this group was likely to be disproportionately more sensitive to the virus. And just as the detection in the Pacific flyway was dwindling, the a high path H5N2 outbreak was detected in Turkey Farm in Minnesota at the very end of February. This began what I consider is the second and completely different phase of the H5 at the high path AI incursion into the US. Over the subsequent months, nearly 95% of the detection were in poultry, with over 200 poultry farms, but only eight backdrop flocks were affected. We tested over a thousand wild birds in each of the active and passive surveillance program, as well as targeted surveillance in some of one of the hardest hit states during this period. And we had only like very only a few wild bird detections. The country as a whole during this period detected only just eleven instances of wild bird infections with the high path virus. To me, these negative results indicated a dramatic decrease in the role of wild birds in the transmission of the high path virus during this period. And as we think about the risk of new potential high path AI introductions in North America and surveillance strategies to monitor for them, I want to remind you of the temporal pattern of three previous high path AI outbreaks in Europe that were associated with wild birds. In these three bar graphs, poultry outbreaks are shown in gray. The date is plotted as days since the first detection on the horizontal axis, and the height of the bars represents the number of premises affected. The number of detections in wild birds are shown in a similar way, but in a gold or yellow color. And much harder to see and much smaller in proportion, detections in captive birds are shown in black. In panel A, which is the timeline for the 2005-2006 high path H5N1 introduction, this was associated with a very few low bird, wild bird and poultry outbreaks early on that was followed by a period of widespread outbreaks on farm. Interestingly, just as the poultry cases were dwindling down, there was a cluster of late wild bird mortality. Panel B shows the European data for the 2014-2015 high path H5N8 incursion. So while North America was experiencing a large scale poultry outbreak 
The H5N8 outbreak in Europe, on the other hand, was associated with very few wild bird or poultry events. Finally, panel C depicts the timeline for the HPAI H5N6 outbreak in 2016-2017. This time, the pattern was different yet again with simultaneous outbreaks in wild bird and in poultry, and the two groups mirrored each other both in timing and in duration. So three high path AI incursions into Europe with three different patterns. How does this past year's uh, pattern look? In this figure, poultry outbreaks are on the top graph and wild birds are on the bottom. Time since October 2020 is on the horizontal axis and different countries are color coded. Beginning with the first report of high path AI h 5 n on a farm in early October, there was a wave of wild bird detections peaking in mid-November. This was followed by a large number of farms becoming infected beginning around Christmas. And the incursion was unusually prolonged with a second wave of infected wild birds being detected in late February, which was then followed by another wave of poultry farms being for a the outbreak finally dying out. So I hope that's shown you how the National Wildlife Health Center's Path Surveillance Program was able to detect the introduction of high path AI virus into the U.S. in 2014, and how the active surveillance program was able to document the surprisingly high proportion of apparently healthy birds that was infected with the virus during the first phase of the outbreak. And the results of the combined active and passive surveillance program indicated a lack of role of wild birds in the outbreak during the second phase. Finally, the, North, the National Wildlife Health Center's active and passive and retaliation surveillance programs could not function without the contributions of wildlife biologists like Paul Zerun, as well as from our state and federal partner agencies. Thank you. Hi, Han. Thanks for that excellent presentation and um, very interesting information as far as the geotemporal spread and looking at the, you know, the, the past um, outbreaks and what we can learn from that and, and certainly the very interesting pattern that we have going on in the 2020-21 outbreak. Uh, we do have just a couple of minutes for questions um, for any of you. Let's put those in the chat. Um, I do have some residual questions from, from the first one, but um, one that I think um, is, is uh, one of the ob topics that you brought up was the circulation in raptors and other birds of concern. Han, do you believe that we're doing adequate surveillance on those animals or is, is our, our species focus um, anything that you would recommend any changes for active or passive surveillance knowing that we may have some different um, susceptibility potentially with the new strains that are circulating? I, I think the, the, the short answer is always more surveillance and more species and more locations, right? Um, but I think what is more important is that if we look back at, especially with the European situation, the different high power viruses had slightly different like presentation in the different groups. So the H5N1 initially seemed to affect the swans and the geese a lot more. Um, some of the subsequent ones uh, was a lot more inapparent in these same groups. And then recently, uh, maybe the 2.3.4.4B seem to be more, have a more preponderance in raptors. So I feel like the surveillance program needs to be nimble and adjust to the situation with the genetics of the virus that we find during that particular season. Very good. And just as a reminder, if any of you have questions for Dr. Ip, let's put those in that chat box on the lower right-hand corner. I don't think I've appreciated the way that you broke the 2014 outbreak out before into that winter, you know, December to February phase and the Pacific coast um, with a higher um, detection in our wild birds. Certainly we've talked about um, previously whether backyard flocks 
you know, understanding that potentially they have lower, um, lower biosecurity, maybe even just lower awareness of circulating viruses and, and what the risks are. And I think the, um, it was brought up yesterday that, you know, would, would we use those as a sentinel for potential introduction or understanding what we might have? Um, not that we want to use backyard flax as a sentinel. I don't think the backyard bird enthusiasts would like that um, terminology, but, but it is um, an item where, where we know that maybe we're not quite getting the messaging or potentially just the biosecurity and knowledge aren't there. And I was wondering whether like, and so we were talking about other, other detection platforms and other signals, whether like monitoring the chatter of the backyard um, group people might be a way to you know to tap into potential outbreaks in those situations without directly having to sort of like go up to them and ask for a sample. Right. Just just if there are any morbidity or mortality events or any type of social media chat or that type of thing where we might get a mm -hmm. use that as an early warning or an additional source of information. Certainly yes, an additional source. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. If. I appreciate all of your information and hope you're able to join us back on the panel discussion um, at, at, in the next hour. Um, we are holding pretty well to our schedule. Um, we do have a short coffee break scheduled. So if everyone wants to um, probably not disconnect, just set your phone or, or your computer down. Um, we'll take about an eight minute break and meet back at the top of the hour um, with Dr. Burhain from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Thank you all and we'll see you back in just a couple of minutes. Thank you That's and welcome back. Though. One moment, let me just put the proper presentation up here. Thank you. While we're getting that switched over, this is Julie Lennott coming back to the second part of our lessons learned from the North American 2014-2015 um, outbreak. And our um, next speaker is Dr. Johan Berhain coming to us from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the Avian Disease Unit, um, where his research focuses mainly on different aspects of influenza A, such as pathogenesis studies in different animal models and risk assessment um, studies for the novel and emerging strains. I know we've got a good lineup going, so Dr. Burhain, let's do a quick audio check, make sure I can hear you. I believe you're muted. Okay, audio one, two, three, audio check, one, two, three. There we go. Uh, take it away, sir. Very interested in what you've got to say. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, at the beginning, I would like uh, to give you uh, a presentation, uh, like a quick introduction to uh, our building where I work and also a brief uh, introduction as how the avian influenza surveillance in uh, wild birds in Canada started. Sorry, I cannot move my slides. Can you use that? There's a little toolbar that comes up on the left hand side that has numbers and you can move it that way. Sorry, uh, can you do the movement for me? Thank you. Sure, one moment. Okay, just tell me next slide when you're ready. Okay, uh, so uh, the National Center for Foreign Animal uh, Health Laboratory is uh, located at the Canadian Science Center for Human and uh, Animal Health. Uh, the building is uh, owned and operated by the federal government of Canada. Uh, the building became fully operational in, 1999. in 1999. Uh, the facility is home to two, uh, lab to two agencies. Uh, one is uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada's uh, National Microbiology Laboratory and uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency uh, this uh, foreign animal disease laboratory. Uh, the building is a uh, workplace to about uh, 500 uh, federal employees. So most of the laboratory uh, is, oh, next slide please. Uh, 
Uh, most of uh, the love space uh, in the building is uh, dedicated to uh, level two and uh, level three laboratories. Uh, as you can see from uh, the slide, the yellow is the level two and uh, the level three. Uh, the CFIA, uh, the building also hosts the uh, level four uh, laboratories for both the animal and uh, the human telescope. Next slide, please. So uh, the mandate uh, of the Foreign Animal Disease Laboratory is to provide scientific and laboratory services for the rapid and accurate identification and uh, reporting of foreign animal disease. This is uh, equivalent to the USDS uh, Plum Island. But in addition, we have uh, avian influenza and uh, Newcastle disease viruses in our mandate. Uh, the lab has five main functions, uh, diagnostic testing services, technology development and research, uh, training, uh, scientific advice, and uh, international uh, consultation. Next slide, please. So uh, the National uh, Avian Influenza Surveillance uh, Program in Canada started in 2005. Uh, the surveillance uh, program started in response to the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak uh, that we had in this in 2004. Uh, this outbreak was uh, the largest in the Canadian history. Uh, it involved uh, 42 commercial poultry farmers. Uh, by the end of the outbreak, uh, 17 million birds were colored, uh, and also 410 commercial poultry farms were de de depopulated. The outbreak cost the Canadian taxpayers over $300 million. Uh, at the time of the outbreak, uh, uh, we didn't process any baseline data on uh, avian influenza in uh, wild birds in Canada. Uh, although the precursor uh, low pathogenic H7 avian influenza virus, which gave uh, uh, from where the highly pathogenic uh, uh, arose, was found in uh, the index uh, farm, uh, we weren't able to identify uh, the source of the virus. Uh, next slide, please. So the National Surveillance Program for Avian Influenza in Wild Birds was uh, initiated to establish uh, an archive of influenza A virus strains uh, circulating in uh, Canadian uh, wild birds to permit a rapid and retrospective analysis in response to disease outbreaks. To sufficiently characterize influenza A viruses so that it would be possible to, to associate future outbreaks with viruses uh, circulating in wild birds to monitor Canadian wild bird populations for the presence of particular influenza viruses, such as the Eurasian H5M1, uh, to build and maintain an integrated multi agency field laboratory, regulatory, and communication capacity to carry out influenza virus sampling, identification, and molecular characterization. The, this will give a way like uh, this will also help in building such an integration integrated communication capacities that will help prepare for other transpondry diseases in the future next slide please so uh, the program had uh, uh, multi uh, multiple uh, participants from uh, uh, different agencies. Uh, the primary federal government particip participants were the Public Health Agency of Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and uh, Environment Canada. In addition, uh, from the provincial laboratory, uh, provincial, la provincial agencies responsible for public and, uh, and animal health. In addition, uh, to the provincial wildlife services. Uh, 
the uh, we had also participants from uh, non uh, government organization such as the Canada Cooperative Wildlife Center, which is located in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, Center for Coastal Hills uh, from Naimo, and DAC Unlimited Canada. Uh, in addition, we have uh, international partners from uh, the United States, such as uh, the United States Department of uh, Agriculture, U.S. Geological Survey, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, uh, the Craig Veterinary Institute, and uh, United States National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, and also Government of uh, Iceland. Next slide, please. So when we started the uh, wild bird surveillance uh, in 2005, uh, we were collecting cloacal uh, swabs only. But since uh, 2006, uh, we started uh, collecting oropharyngeal and uh, clinical swabs uh, from uh, each uh, bird. Next slide. So in uh, 2005, the, uh, collected, uh, the collection sites uh, were uh, spread uh, all over uh, the country, as you can see from uh, uh, the black the black dogs. Next slide, please. So what will happen is the uh, regional uh, wildlife uh, services uh, they will collect uh, uh, the samples from uh, the wild ducks, and uh, they will uh, submit them to the regional uh, laboratories for uh, testing. So the provincial labs uh, will do the screening using the influenza A matrix. Uh, this will be followed by the H5 and uh, H7 real-time uh, RT-PCR assays. Then uh, positive uh, samples for H5 and uh, H7 uh, were forwarded to uh, NCFAD uh, for uh, molecular phototyping and also isolation. Uh, this was happening until uh, 2015, but after 2015, we, in addition, we requested also to send all the metrics, uh, positive samples, so that uh, we can do uh, characterized isolation and the further characterization of the samples followed by archiving. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, to show you uh, a picture uh, what uh, our uh, surveillance uh, for the first time uh, showed in Canada. Uh, as you can see, uh, the prevalence of uh, influenza A uh, from what we saw in 2005 was uh, very high in uh, uh, Dublin ducks and also in wood ducks. Okay, and uh, uh, the prevalence uh, based, uh, this is the, the following slide is summarized uh, breakdown of the samples, positive samples uh, based on uh, province. So as you can see, the highest uh, detection uh, we saw in uh, British Columbia, followed by Ontario and Quebec. And uh, for 2005, for example, uh, we saw a lot of, uh, uh, like from the positive uh, samples, we saw around 25% uh, uh, positivity for uh, H5, which uh, uh, we weren't able uh, to duplicate uh, uh, like on further years. Next slide, please. So to give you a brief summary from uh, what we saw, the most uh, common H-types that we see in our surveillance are the H3, H4, and the H6s. Uh, the most uh, rare uh, HS subtypes, H16, H8, I forget to add H12 over here, and H13. Uh, the most uh, common NA subtypes are M2, N6, and N8. Uh, we never uh, detected 
the H15 subtype the virus is in our uh, surveillance. The most common NA and HA combinations are H3N8, H4N6, and uh, H3N2. Uh, prevalence of H5 and uh, H7 subtypes appears uh, to follow a, a cyclical uh, pattern based on our surveillance. Next slide, please. So in 2005, uh, we didn't see any uh, H7 positive samples, but we saw uh, quite uh, a variety of uh, H5 samples. Uh, next slide. Uh, in 2006, uh, the same trend. Next slide. But in 2007, we all of a sudden uh, we started uh, to, de to detect uh, H7 uh, subtype uh, viruses in addition to the H5. Next slide. So uh, when we detected uh, the H7 samples, uh, what we saw is on uh, some of uh, the samples that uh, we that we isolated, we uh, we weren't uh, uh, able to detect them by the H7 uh, real-time uh, RT-PCR. So uh, uh, when we did uh, retrospective uh, analysis, what happened was uh, the H7 subtype viruses that were circulating at that time, they had uh, a number of uh, mutations in uh, the primers and prop uh, regions of uh, the H7. But uh, to come back to what I said, uh, uh, since we were doing uh, isolation for all, uh, uh, for most of the influenza uh, positive samples in 2006 and or in 2007, uh, from the isolators that we had, we weren't able to pick up any H7 uh, subtype. Uh, viruses. Uh, next slide. So while this was happening, uh, we got uh, an, a highly pathogenic uh, avian influenza out outbreak in uh, southern uh, Saskatchewan uh, province. And uh, the virus which was uh, responsible uh, for the outbreak uh, wasn't uh, we weren't able to detect it by the HMR real time RT PCR, but at that time, since we were doing uh, the validation of the modified uh, real time RT PCR, uh, we were uh, lucky enough uh, to, to pick up uh, 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 this virus. Uh, next slide. So uh, Canada white, when we are doing Canada white, uh, the Canada white uh, avian influenza surveillance uh, lasted uh, until 2007. Then this was replaced by the dead bird surveillance from 2008 until the uh, current evenings. And uh, Dr. Group led by Dr. Susan Sus is doing limited surveillance on uh, blue winged teal in uh, provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, Manitoba, starting from 2007 uh, until uh, the present time. I think this was uh, briefly interrupted by the COVID-19 in uh, 2020. Uh, during all uh, this our surveillance uh, periods, uh, we weren't able to detect any Gus-Kundan-like uh, viruses in our surveillance. However, uh, gene segments from Euro-Asian lineage are uh, relatively rarely detected in uh, wild bird samples collected in Alberta, Canada, and the Delaware Bay. This was shown by uh, Webster Group, and uh, we have seen uh, this rare uh, like uh, reassortment also uh, in our samples. Next slide. 
So in early 2014, outbreaks caused by H5N8 virus belonging to the GSG lineage H5 viruses were reported in South Korea. Uh, in this uh, outbreak uh, was linked to migratory uh, birds that were uh, suspected to play the role in introduction of the virus from China to Korea. In late fall 2014, H5N8 clade 2.344 viruses was reported in Europe and East Asia. Concurrently, in December 2014, the assortant viruses belonging to this lineage were detected in domestic poultry in BC and in Washington in captive, fal uh, in captive falcons, wild birds, and uh, uh, backyard poultry. Next slide. So in November, in November 28, 2014, highly pathogenic avian uh, influenza virus uh, caused by novel research. The assertant H5N2 virus was detected in 83-year-old meat turkeys in commercial farm in uh, Fraser Valley, BC. Uh, on November 30, another broiler breeder flock eight kilometers away experienced a 10% mortality over 24-hour period. Uh, this uh, farm was also diagnosed to have H5N2. Uh, from November 28, to December 19, 2014, uh, 11 commercial uh, premises and one non-commercial premise were diagnosed with uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. So the H5 N2 uh, virus was a novel reassortant virus. Next slide, uh, please. Uh, it uh, contained uh, five gene segments from the Eurasian H5, clade 2.344, and three from uh, the North American lineage uh, low pathogenic uh, avian influenza viruses. Next slide, please. So, 40 kilometers from the Canadian outbreak site in Weiser Lake in Watcom County in Washington, uh, they were able to detect uh, fully Eurasian H5N8 in Great Falcon. On December 6, and there was also detection of uh, the uh, Eurasian North American reassortant H5N2 virus, similar to the virus which caused the H5N2 outbreak uh, in Fraser Valley in BC on December 8. Uh, both viruses were associated with bile bird uh, mortalities. Active surveillance of resident uh, waterfall in Fraser Valley during the outbreak did not show any presence of uh, GSGD lineage uh, H5 virus. Next slide. Okay. Uh, as you know, uh, Fraser Valley is uh, uh, Fraser Valley uh, farmlands are used as a resting ground for a large population of uh, migratory waterfowl during uh, the fall migration. Uh, during 2014, uh, a high rainfall uh, was uh, observed in the area. Uh, uh, they said, based on the epidemiologic report, that, that uh, this was uh, unusually high amount of rainfall. And the uh, large gathering of waterfall on the standing water on the farmland around uh, infected premises was observed during uh, the outbreak. Uh, wild waterfall and rodents uh, seeking shelter from freezing temperature uh, might have uh, contributed uh, to the outbreak. This uh, some of the work that uh, Chelsea uh, is going to present showed uh, uh, the presence of uh, viruses in those. Uh, water are in the standing water around the farms. Okay, uh, the following uh, slide shows uh, the spatial distribution of uh, uh, infected uh, premises with uh, 
highly pathogenic avian influenza. Uh, the green dots, they show the, the firms and uh, uh, the red, uh, that's the, uh, what you call the uh, quarantine zone around the, the firms. Next slide. So uh, from uh, the outbreak, uh, we weren't able uh, to show how the virus got into the index premise number one and number two. Uh, but uh, uh, further epidemiological uh, investigation showed uh, that uh, the virus uh, was able to move from IP1 to IP3 and from IP1 to IP4 uh, as uh, uh, the farms uh, IP1 shipped like uh, spiking uh, males uh, within the first week uh, before the first week of uh, the outbreak. So the outbreak, uh, the outbreak virus was uh, epidemiologically linked uh, to IP1. And the next part where we were able to show uh, direct contact, uh, direct epidemiological contact is uh, between IP5 and uh, IP6. Uh, from IP5 and IP6, uh, they belong to a couple of uh, brothers and uh, those farmers, uh, they uh, shared catching crew and uh, they were uh, like uh, in close uh, proximity to each other as well. So in uh, other uh, format, uh, the epidemiological investigation that was done was uh, only uh, able to show like uh, a suspected link only. Next slide, please. So on uh, February 2, 2015, uh, uh, we had another, another uh, virus, which is a reassortant, H5N1 virus, was detected in uh, a backyard flock uh, in BC. Uh, this virus uh, was, uh, had a totally different reassortment. It has uh, four gene segments from the Eurasian clay 2.344 virus, uh, and uh, four gene segments from the North American uh, low pathogenic avian influenza virus. Next slide, please. So, Dr. Uh, Berhain, I, I hate to interrupt. I just want to make sure we're keeping track of time. If you can um, okay, potentially okay. skip through a little bit of the details and we'll um, take some okay. of the questions for the panel discussion. Okay, 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 sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, when we did full genome sequencing, what we saw is uh, the uh, H5N1 virus had uh, uh, a 17 amino acid deletion in the NA region. Sorry, I will go. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the deletion in the stalk region, uh, the virus was different from the H5N1, which was detected in the American green wing field in uh, Washington, DC, uh, because this one has uh, the deletion of the 17 amino acids, uh, 19 amino acids in the NA stalk region. Next slide, please. So uh, retrospective investigation of uh, in Canada, what we saw is uh, on March 31st, 2015, a highly pathogenic H5N8 virus was detected in a frozen hunter killed duck tissue that uh, was uh, hunter killed on November to December 2015. Uh, in addition, uh, in January 13, 2015, a Cooper Hawk that was presented to the provincial laboratory uh, with head trauma had also H5N1 virus detected. Uh, this uh, H5N1 from the Cooper Hawk had uh, 19 amino acid deletion as well. So this is uh, viruses, same in genetic composition with the uh, hunter killed from uh, with the H5N1 virus uh, from uh, the American grid we killed from uh, Washington, uh, except for the deletion. Next slide, please. 
So uh, for the BC outbreak, 140,000 animals were killed uh, as part of the eradication. Uh, the, the last H5 uh, in two infected commercial farm was detected on December 17. Uh, last commercial farm to be released from the quarantine was on March 25, 2015. Post outbreak surveillance was concluded on uh, June 3, 2015. Next slide, please. So uh, further on the east, uh, we had uh, another H5N2 uh, outbreak in Ontario. Uh, the Oxford, in Oxford County, southern part of Ontario, Ox Oxford County is located on southwest Ontario and lies within the Mississippi fly Flyway. Uh, Ontario represents 50% of the total Canadian uh, poultry uh, sector. Uh, so for the two infected carnivores, the source of the virus was suspected to be contact with uh, wild birds. And for the three, the farm was very, it had high uh, security, but it was uh, located uh, not far away from one of the infected farms, I think within uh, one uh, kilometer radius. So the outbreak was uh, controlled uh, in a short uh, period of time. and. Uh, uh, further, uh, like uh, wild bird surveillance in the area, we, uh, we collected around 1,390 swab samples. Uh, we weren't uh, uh, able to demonstrate any presence of GSGT lineage uh, H5 virus. Next slide, please. So uh, the following graph uh, summarizes uh, uh, viruses that uh, we isolated uh, from domestic poultry from different uh, provinces, starting from 1995 to 2021. The red ones are the, the ones that cause a highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak. The green ones are uh, low pathogenic H5 or H7 subtype viruses. Next slide. So, uh, uh, in short, uh, active surveillance in wild birds during or after the outbreak did not yield presence of the SGT lineage, uh, H5 uh, influenza, vi influenza viruses. Uh, indication of virus was present in wild birds prior to outbreak, uh, based on our uh, surveillance, like dead bird surveillance that we saw in ESA and Canada. Also, uh, one of the things that we have to improve is delays in checking samples on time. For example, the hunter killer duck that was killed uh, on between, uh, like the hunting uh, period in BC is from September 24 to uh, January 24. Uh, so, but we received the fishes from the hunter killer ducks on March 31st, 2015. The copper hawk, which was supposed to have died from a trauma, was submitted on January 13, but uh, was checked for the presence of AI later in 2015. So for 2021, uh, we are planning to do to go back to 2005 and to do uh, Canada-wide uh, active surveillance and also passive surveillance of uh, hunter kill attacks uh, from all over uh, the Canadian provinces. And the CFIA plans to release the IV surveillance data in a timely manner. Now, this is what I have. Uh, sorry for taking too long. So these are uh, most of the participants of the wild bird surveillance. Uh, sorry if I, I might have missed some because there are so many in there. Thank you everyone for your attention. If you have questions, I we stay for now and also for the break later. Dr. Berhain, thank you for that comprehensive overview and, and certainly, you know, 25 years of, of great work going on in Canada. Um, I, I have several questions written down. Um, I'm going to hold them until we get to the panel, but greatly appreciate that information and excited to hear that there's um, both active and passive surveillance plan for 2021 um, Canada-wide. 
Um, I'm going to hold the questions in the chat right now um, just to make sure we get through our, our final speaker from Canada, and um, then we will um, invite everyone back for panel discussion. So, Dr. Berhain, thank you very much. I'm going to switch over um, and introduce Dr. Chelsea Hemsworth um, coming to us from the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. Um, Dr. Hemsworth is a veterinary pathologist and the leader for veterinary science and diagnostics at the Animal Health Center. Um, she worked on a great deal of information for avian influenza and the surveillance of infectious um, disease, particularly zoonotic disease and diseases involving free ranging wildlife. Um, Chelsea, I see your slide switched over. Let's do a quick audio check. Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. I you're lovely coming through loud and clear. I'll hand it over to you and we're looking forward to the information you've got. Go ahead, Dr. Hensworth. Okay, excellent. I will, uh, I will try to be brief uh, because I'm just going to be talking about a shorter snippet of time, not 20 years worth of work. But I do want to acknowledge my co-investigators on this. Uh, Dr. Sao and Prestijeki are my co-primary investigators and our great team of postdocs and grad students, Kevin Kuczynski, uh, Jun Duan, and Michelle Coombe, who I think are on here today. And like most great grad students, uh, eclipse their mentors quickly and will be here to answer difficult questions that I can't answer. So with that, let's talk about something a little bit different, a different approach to avian influenza surveillance. So we all know that one of the limitations associated with avian influenza surveillance is the difficulty obtaining a robust sample of wild birds. However, given that waterfowl shed virus in the GI tract, it might be possible to detect avian influenza viruses in environmental substrates that contain fecal material. Now, there are a great number of potential environmental substrates, for example, feces, quite widely used now, water, and sediment. But we were particularly interested in superficial sediment, which is the organic and inorganic material that settles at the bottom of a water column. And that's because sediment's more concentrated than water, and a single sample could contain feces and avian influenza viruses from a variety of donors, from multiple waterfowl. However, sediments can't be analyzed using traditional diagnostic modalities because virus is present at a very low concentration, often degraded, and add mixed with a, a, a yucky soup of non-AIV genetic material and inhibitory substances. So by partnering with Genome British Columbia, we were actually able to use the genomics technology targeted resequencing in which a specific set of AIV genes are isolated and sequenced from a substrate to see if we could find AIDS and influenza in sediments collected from large wetlands and smaller water bodies on farms during the 2014-2015 outbreak. So we were actually able to mobilize during the outbreak to test this new technology. And in our study, we were able to detect AIDS and influenza in up to 24% of sediment samples, and this compared to about a 1% detection rate in our passive surveillance system in uh, wild birds. And this bar graph, shows, so we've got the, the wet samples from large wetlands and smaller wetlands on farm, that we were able to detect a huge diversity of avian influenza subtypes with up to eight HA and eight NA subtypes in a single sediment sample. So huge information value. But did we get the money shot? And the answer is yes, we did. So we did, were able to find the outbreak virus and found that it was actually widespread in wetlands throughout the Fraser Valley. So perhaps we could have detected it in advance of the outbreak had this approach been available. So given that this was quite promising as a technology, we endeavored to uh, set out to refine the laboratory methods, to validate the approach in the field, and to compare with current surveillance standards. And now I'm gonna go over each element briefly with a focus on lessons learned with a caveat that this is a long-term program of research. So we are still um, uh, finishing up, but we are hoping to roll out for this surveillance system to actually use the tool. Okay, so what do we do in the lab? I just told you that the lab methods are, are quite challenging. Well, I'm gonna give you a very simplified version. 
So the first thing we do is we take about two grams of sediment or two teaspoons of mud and we perform a manual chloroform-based extraction. Now, this is one of the biggest impediments to large-scale rollout. We haven't been found a good way to automate it yet, but the method we currently use does work. And then the positive samples are screened by PCR, or sorry, the uh, RNA extracts screened by PCR, the positive samples then go on to library construction. And this uses a custom protocol to increase the likelihood that rare scraps of flu genome are incorporated into our sequencing library. And then we use, this is our, our technology that uh, we've developed in-house, or rather I should say Kevin Kuczynski has developed, is uh, a library. Uh, so we use, we enrich the library for AIV using a custom probe panel of 3,600 probes targeting the HA, NA, and matrix genes. And these probes were designed based on 36,000, over 36,000 reference sequences. So the enriched libraries are then sequenced. And then Jun jumps into the picture, our bioinformatician, and he uh, transfers the, the data to a custom built platform called AIV Seeker that performs the bioinformatics analysis. And that is awesome because it transforms data that I do not understand at all into lovely graphs and figures that I can understand to provide reports on things like subtyping and phylogenetic analysis. So what did we learn from, from our work? We learned that probe capture approaches used by commercial genomics providers can't cope with this extreme diversity of avian influenza. That's why we developed this custom tool for AIV probe design. And it's great because it's one that can be, it's open source, so all of you can use it, and it can be updated as new strains of avian influenza evolve. We've also adapted the tool to use in other viruses like noroviruses and bat coronaviruses. We also learned that the library prep part of the workflow is the most important step for the limit of detection. So I mentioned like this stuff is so rare in there. So we had to, again, develop customized protocols to retain this rare, low abundance material. And then finally, the main problem is that the AIV sequences that we end up getting are very short, which makes it challenging to reliably perform phylogenetic analysis. So currently we're using a highly conservative approach, so we know we're losing data. It's, it's something we continue to, to work on and optimize. Okay, so now let's get out into the field, which is uh, most of our natural habitat. So we then performed longitudinal uh, sediment and wild bird sampling in three key large wetlands in the Fraser Valley. And the goal of this was to determine if the AI viruses obtained from sediment provide a representative and contemporaneous picture of those circulating in waterfowl. So that's really the goal, right? We're using sediment as a proxy for waterfowl here, so it has to represent what's circulating in waterfowl. So we selected wetlands that were known hotspots for waterfowl abundance and diversity, and then scooped our mud about two meters away from the shoreline to target areas used by dabbling ducks. The samples uh, were collected from the exact same locations or as close as we could get uh, monthly over the course of two years and live birds using those wetlands were trapped and sampled every three months. So we collected a total of uh, over 2,000 sediments and 711 wide wild bird samples and screened those using PCR with genomic analysis that I just described. So what did we find? So we assigned each sequence to a cluster. Now that's sort of our, our closest resolution, our best approximation of an AIV string. And we detected a total of 448 unique clusters, of which 75 were found in both birds and sediment. 149 were found only in live birds, and 224 were found only in sediment. So this is interesting. So we're seeing some overlap, but some unique to the different sample sources. Now, here I present the N1 clusters as an example. So each of those horizontal lines 
uh, on the screen is an individual cluster. And the sequences obtained from sediment are in green, the sequences in live birds are in blue. Now remember for this, we sampled across the whole year. So any of those months could be populated. And what we saw here is that there are more N1 clusters in sediment than in birds. But interestingly, so many of the shared N1 clusters in the sediment appear a year prior to observing them in birds. So if we find a cluster, we tend to find it in sediment before birds. Now this might be surprising, but if you dive into the uh, environmental surveillance literature, it's actually consistent and it's thought that basically um, it's easier to find it in sediment. It be, it's probably present in birds the year before, but at a low enough prevalence that you're probably not gonna detect it by capturing individual wild birds, but you will detect it in sediment. And finally, we see the clusters in sediment changing over time. So we're not seeing long-term persistence of RNA in wetlands. We're not gonna cry wolf based on uh, sediment sequences that we found years previously. So then what do we wanna do? We wanted to compare it to current surveillance standards. And for us, that would be uh, hunter killed birds. So we set out over again, over the course of two years to uh, cap gather a total of 1, 000, over 1,000 sediment samples from 18 wetlands. So now this is more extensive. We're not doing it like really intensively in a few wetlands longitudinally over time. We're rolling out during the fall surveillance season, two years in a row in a broader area. So 18 wetlands and also collected 580 samples from hunter harvested birds. So we could do a head to head comparison. And again, screening with PCR and genomics. And what did we see? Okay, so a total of 434 clusters, remember this is our closest approximation to a strain, found uh, in total, of which 85 were shared between hunted birds and sediment. This is where the difference gets more stark. So 43 were unique only to hunted birds, but 306 were unique to sediment. So a huge amount uh, more data in the, the sediment, although still some unique clusters to, to the hunter kill birds. And again, similarly to, to before, now this, this graph's a little more deceiving because that big chunk in the middle should be blank because again, we only rolled out in the fall uh, season. But I want you to appreciate using N1 as an example, more clusters in sediments than in birds, and many of the shared clusters so now we've got uh, sediment in green and hunted birds in orange. Many of the shared clusters appearing the year before in sediment before we detect them in the birds. Okay, so what did we learn from this experience? The ideal sampling method, birds versus environment, is gonna depend on the specific goals of a surveillance program. So for example, you need bird samples if you wanna understand AIV ecology. You can't get that from, from the sediment samples. Whereas the environmental samples might be better suited to detecting low high risk or low prevalence strains. You also need to think about the context. If there are wetlands with existing bird banding programs, then surveillance through wild bird sampling might be the easier method. But if you're interested in areas that restrict hunting or live capture of birds, then such as highly urban areas. So some of our, our biggest avian influenza um, laden water bodies were in our most urban uh, areas. And for those, environmental samples are a much better alternative to, to live bird capture. You also need to think about resources. So sediments are great if you have strong lab resources like we do in BC. So our partner is our CDC, the BC Center for Disease Control, and they're an incredible resource. Um, and so we're really strong on the lab side, which allows us uh, to, to use these techniques, we're, we're less well set up uh, on the field side. We don't have a lot of people doing active bird banding. But if that's something that you're stronger in then, uh, and less strong on the lab side, then sticking with the, uh, the wild bird surveillance may be preferable. But ultimately, it's important to keep in mind that you will find strains in sediment you don't find in birds and vice versa. So ultimately, if you can find the cache, pairing the two samples may help to increase overall program sensitivity.
And that's it for me. I also want to shout out to, to Johannes after uh, teasing him about taking all my time that he has been uh, really crucial to helping us pilot and uh, validate the technology. So thank you to Johannes. And with that, I will take questions. Chelsea, thank you so much. From Andy. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to read that out. I didn't know if you could um, manage the chat and, the, you know, just very interesting information on your environmental sampling and the, the AI soup and you taking your, your ladles and going in and getting those environmental samples and the tools that you've got available. Um, so we'll take this one um, specific to you and then I'll give everybody a quick break and we'll come back for panel. But from, um, from Andy, great presentation, Chelsea. What role do you envision sediment sampling playing um, in British Columbia, Canada um, for highly pathogenic avian influenza for, for this year, for this late summer and autumn season? Thanks. Yeah, so in an ideal world, and this is something we're, we're, we're trying to, to pull together and shout out to Cynthia and Vicki and Johannes and everyone uh, working to, to get a better surveillance system in, uh, in BC. So um, we are hoping to balance the promise, but also perceived risk with rolling out a new technology. I do work for government, and we all know governments tend to be risk averse, and things that are new are like, oh my god. So we're hoping to balance that by doing the doing live bird targeted live bird surveillance, uh, hunter killed surveillance, ramping up our passive surveillance, and incorporating the sediment. So we're just hoping to go whole hog this year in an attempt because we know it's a higher risk season and also to get um, a better sense out of the research context of like on an ongoing basis, how do these compare? Uh, ultimately, we want to do a cost benefit ratio of how much uh, each of these tools cost versus the informational value to get that optimal pairing. So yeah, we're, we're hoping to roll it all out Go government of BC, fund our program. <laughs> Great, I think one more question for you um, from Marco. How long do you know um, the RNA remains in the environment? And the second part of that is, are the sediments analyzed in pool? I think meaning like, are they um, combined batch samples? Oh, that's a great question, uh, Marco. So the sediments are not um, pooled. They are done individually. Um, and how long does it remain? The answer is, I don't know, like in a field sense, yeah, um, we, I don't know if I can like flash back or if that's going to be super annoying. Nope. Uh, let me just a sec. Uh, so what you see here is that longitudinal study where we're going back to like the same areas as close as possible uh, every single month. And you can see that we are detecting certain strains in certain months and not in the following months. So we're not seeing this like ongoing consistent month to month where we're finding like this N1 cluster here and again and again. It really seems to, the RNA seems to degrade quite quickly. Now, we had initially set out to, to do a, um, a, a laboratory experiment, but then with our field knowledge, just how do you even approximate in the laboratory all of the biotic and abiotic and weather conditions, et cetera? So we ended up abandoning that and using this field proxy. And again, it, just, it doesn't seem to persist for a long time in the sediment in the superficial sediment. That's the one nice thing about the superficial part is these wetlands also contract and expand. So you are getting that summer in our area, the wetlands contract and they just get like baked in the sun all summer uh, before the birds then arrive in the fall and redeposit the new sediment. And you get that layering effect too. So we're not digging super deep. So we're hopefully getting like the freshest sediment. Very good. And uh, one more question coming at you. Um, a note um, from Dr. Han. At Chelsea, very nice progress on this technology. And the question is, does the, um, do the probes capture non-avian influenza viruses? Non-avian influenza viruses. The 
Are you, can you unmute Kevin Kuczynski? Kevin, I see you there. This is Kevin's baby. One moment. Hi, everyone. Hey, you're unmuted. Uh, Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the short answer is yes. Um, there's, there's enough similarity in the nucleotide sequences of non-avian influenza A viruses that the, 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 the current version of the pro panel will have, you know, decent luck pulling down non-avian origin HA, NA, and definitely matrix segments. Now, uh, the closest we've come to testing this outside of, uh, you know, computer predictions is uh, Johannes has provided us in the past with uh, validation materials, as has the National Microbiology Laboratory, and we have isolates, a cultured isolates of zoonotic human H5 and H7 infections, and the, ca uh, the probes captured those perfectly fine. So I think uh, the when when the flu viruses spill over, um, those those initial spillover events, they still retain so much similarity to their avian precursors that um, as far as the genome sequences go, they're almost indistinguishable from avian influenza viruses. So we also like to advertise that this technology and this this, this particular set of probes is also a useful tool for pandemic preparedness and pandemic response, as well as the, uh, the surveillance and outbreak prevention uses of it. Very good. Thank, thank you, Kevin and Chelsea. Very interesting developments on this technology. Very, very exciting. Uh, so I think we're doing very well on time. I'm going to give everybody a another seven minute break and um, Chelsea and Johannes, I hope you're able to stay on with us for panel discussion. So um, let's take a quick break and meet back at five after the hour and um, I'll get started on panel discussion then. See you in a few minutes, folks. Hi everyone and welcome back. Hopefully you had a chance to get a, get a drink and uh, stretch your legs a little bit. Um, get, get us back into um, into our um, panel session right now. So, um, excellent day for exciting speakers from the United States and from Canada on the lessons learned from the 2014, 2015, and, and additional historic information and kind of what we've got going on for emerging um, technologies. So, I will um, start off and I can monitor both the chat line. We can also open the audio lines here and um, Johannes and Han and Tom, I just wanted to make sure everyone is still available. Um, and I can go back and kind of field some of these previous um, questions that are going on here. So um, making sure we captured all the information, I'm gonna go back to um, Johannes. Um, given the recent outbreaks um, of highly pathogenic avian influenza and wild birds in Eurasia, can you speak to um, how the federal government is ramping up or modifying the wild bird surveillance in Canada for the upcoming year, summer and autumn of 2021? And I know Cynthia um, chimed in, but wanted to see if Cynthia or Johannes wanted to add any more to that one um, before we move on. Yeah, uh, I can answer to that. Uh, like we are going back to the Canada-wide uh, live bird surveillance that uh, we did in 2005. So samples are already coming from uh, some of uh, the provinces. And I think uh, in addition, we are doing also additional uh, uh, hunter killed uh, duck, uh, like a co collection of samples from hunter killed ducks. So uh, the federal government and other partners are uh, going to be actively engaging uh, in 2021. Very good. And uh, Cynthia did write in the chat looking at um, 500 
birds per province, and I assume those are the uh, southern provinces across Canada. Um, and then again, adding on that, um, maybe it's opportunistic sampling or um, targeted sampling for hunter birds in the fall um, in um, collaboration with the field biologist and a contractor in British Columbia. Okay, scrolling all the way back, um, making sure that Tom and Han are on. Um, Tom, for you, can you expand more? Oh, sorry, we did the wetlands question. Um, do you have any comments on the recent low pass H5 activities in the last few years after the 2014, 2015 outbreaks? And would it be possible that these pose a higher risk for introduction and spread like the H5? So I can um, send that to either um, to Tom or to Han and Henry. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I guess I'll take a shot at it first. Um, so one of, the, one of the big advantages in long-term surveillance is that you get a picture at a continental scale or at least a national scale um, of, of uh, low path viruses circulating in um, uh, reservoirs, in this case, wild bird populations. So since we've been conducting various levels of surveillance over the last, um, you know, 17, 18, whatever it is, 15 years, um, we've gotten a pretty good picture of how different um, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase subtypes cycle in wild bird populations, um, and even some of the actual viruses that circulate in wild bird populations at different um, scales, geographic scales across the continent. Um, and I think what the question's getting at is um, um, what we observe is um, these periodic increases and decreases of certain hemagglutin types in the wild bird populations. And H5 is no um, uh, subtype, uh, hemagglutin subtypes are, is no different there. We do tend to see these um, uh, cycles of peaks and and valleys in the prevalence of H5 viruses in the wild bird populations. We actually even see from work that um, uh, we work, we did with uh, Dr. Henry Wan, I think is on this um, call, we even see that certain H5 viruses tend to be more confined to the Pacific flyway while, while others uh, occur in, uh, are more prevalent in the uh, Atlantic flyway. So we've got these spatial temporal patterns of, of some of these low path viruses, and we'll stick with H5s, um, you know, uh, uh, across the continent. And that's something that um, ties back into the immunology questions we, ha we talked about earlier. So um, one hypothesis is, is that as we tend to see those H5 viruses increase in wild birds, um, are we getting um, a buildup of H5 immunity, cross immunity on the H5 hemagglutin types that um, essentially may provide enhanced protection due to an incursion of a transcontinental H5 virus entering the country? Um, and likewise, alternatively, when we're in one of those troughs and we have years that, that there's not very much H5 virus circulating, are birds after a couple of years, you know, newer birds entering the population, less exposure to H viruses, are they more immunologically naive uh, to um, H5 viruses and maybe less cross immunity that might be protective to an incursion from an intercontinental virus? I think we don't really know that for sure right at this point, but my hypothesis is, is that that's probably has some role based on some of the research that folks like Stallnex Group and USDA and others have done um, that we probably do see some um, uh, level of population immunity and cross protection to hemagglutinin within, at least within a hemagglutinin type. So, um, so it does beg the question, you know, we have been in a bit of a trough of H5 prevalence. Um, we're, we're, the last couple of years, we haven't been seeing as many H5 uh, viruses in, in, in the large-scale surveillance efforts. Um, and so it does beg the question, um, what 
might that mean to an incursion of a, of a new intercontinental H5 virus? We, we were actually, when we had the previous one in 2014, we were, we have been, we have been coming off a relatively higher H5 prevalence of low path viruses uh, in the birds at the time. So it's an interesting question. I don't know that we have an answer for that, but, and I hope we don't find out um, what the answer <laughs> is, but I'll leave it at that. Han, do you want to jump in? About the only thing that I want to add, I, that was a very thorough, comprehensive answer, Tom. Um, the only additional thing that I might add in is I wonder whether there is some degree of cross-protection with wild birds being exposed to some of the other subtypes, not in addition to low path H5, that may be contrib contributing to their resistance to the high path virus as well, too. So. Absolutely. It's yeah, great point. Yep. So together, I think it's just like the whole combination of the immuno exposure, previous exposure, might have a role. Yep. Yep. I, I agree totally, Han. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. Um, I'll pause for just a second, just in case anyone else wants to chime in on that one. All right. Very good. Um, Kyle asked a question quite a while ago, and I'm not sure if it was um, intended for U.S. Um, US government or Canadian government, um, but the question is, um, essentially, are swabs from wild waterfowl part of surveillance that they are not subtyped other than determining if um, HPAI is present, kind of that binary response, like yes or no to HPAI, and maybe that we're not going further to subtype. I don't know if Kyle's on the line and wants to expand on that a little bit more. Guessing the question might be um, looking more at do we need to dig a little deeper into H5, H7s, and, and actually sequencing those out. And I think most of us would agree that that information would be um, beneficial both as far as risk and then simple knowledge. So um, I don't know if Kyle can chime back in either on chat or if I'm, and Tom, do you want to take a stab at that one? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I can provide. Sorry, this is Kyle. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't think there's much to add. I guess the point of it is that some of us uh, that are tasked with getting our biologists to get a swab into a vial and the vial disappears, uh, I don't know if folks are really aware of sort of what happens after that, right? So the folks that are actually running around trying to get the samples in hand. So I was, I was asking for some clarification to make sure that that, uh, that that was accurate, that that's sort of the process of once the vial goes to a lab and is run, what is it that actually is coming out of that? Because there's a lot of discussion around some of the low, the you know, the uh, low, low path subtypes, but my understanding is that's not what's being derived from, from that sampling regime. So uh, the, the point of sort of what sampling is going on now versus what questions are being asked is that mismatched to some, dis some, to some degree. And Kyle, are you are you referring to the U.S. or Canada? Uh, U.S. I can't answer the question. <laughs> U.S. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and take a stab at that. You know, the the U.S. Um, uh, at least from the USDA perspective side, um, our focus is, as you pointed out, is we first determine if we have a, a any influenza in the sample basically um, influenza type A in the sample. If the answer to that is yes, then we do um, immediately conduct the uh, primers for NH5 and NH7. If either one of those are positive, those samples are shipped to NVSL um, and uh, we quickly get a determination on um, what the H5 or H7 in that sample is. Now, we do we do take all the non H uh, all type A positives non H five H seven positives. Um, we do bring those we do ship those back to the archive in Fort Collins, and then we we systematically um, usually depending on funds, but um, pretty you know we're pretty good about getting those samples into either virus isolation or some type of sequencing. That's a much lower priority. Um, for USDA, but we do um, get those out. And in fact, um, some of those um, 
uh, studies that I mentioned in my presentation and just the one that I mentioned on the last answer um, that we conducted with Dr. Juan in the University of Missouri on distribution of H5 and, 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 some, and there's a lot of other people on that paper that are on this call. Um, uh, we combine all our results across all these groups and we try and use that data then to provide a more clear understanding of low path influenzas. So while the one, while the H5H7 is more of an immediate, um, you know, process of, of trying to determine what we have and is it potentially a, a, a low path or a high path of uh, significance, um, we do take those other ones out um, to, um, as far as we can, based on the quality of the sample and, and the amount of virus in those samples. And we do try and learn from those others and, and make adjustments to our surveillance program as necessary. It doesn't get as much uh, doesn't get as much uh, press, if you will, as the H five H sevens. But um, we do we do try and um, characterize as many of these as we can financially and logistically with time. Do I think it's a great great um, segue into into discussion and possibly moving back to our Canadian colleagues. So. Kyle, for you, kind of the boots on the ground and being, uh, you know, in that team of field biologists collecting those samples and, you know, not knowing exactly what happens with those. Um, our our goal, of course, is to use this as that as that alert and, and emerging um, kind of emerging disease warning system. And I think going back to what Johannes had mentioned during his presentation, and if I can call him back, how do we improve that? Um, timing for for um, information coming back. So from the laboratory results to making those detections and using that as a communication tool to our um, to our producers and our stakeholders. And Johannes, I know that you um, you know you ended one of your slides as far as lessons learned um, with how how to improve the timing of that. So I'll send it over to you to you know to chime in on on what else we can do to to improve that um, efficiency of that messaging. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, in terms of H5 and H7 viruses, uh, the results are basically uh, within a week or uh, 10 days. They should go out uh, to the field. We try to give the information as fast as possible. But for the other metrics, positive samples, we kind of, uh, depending on the workload in the lab, we kind of do them uh, not quickly, but we try to do them uh, as much as uh, possible uh, very fast. It also will depend how many positives we have. If you get like 700, 800 positive samples to go through isolation and uh, sequencing, uh, it takes a lot of time. So sometimes this work can stagger up to summer when we have basically a LA period. That's when we tend to do a lot of catch-ups. Winter is usually very busy for us. But in terms of funding, the federal government has been always supportive. So they tend uh, to fund the World Health Surveillance uh, very well. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm getting messages that we do have maybe some comments coming in on the phone line. Um, I can go over, is that Dr. Ann Justice Allen? Um, You're unmuted, please go ahead. Hi, I have a couple of questions regarding um, future surveillance in uh, the United States. Um, so in the past, uh, there has been some funds available for state wildlife agencies to conduct surveillance. And I was, um, and generally that's been hunter harvest type of surveillance. We do see quite a few um, individual bird mortalities, primarily raptors, and I was wondering if funds would be available to, um, and a process available to collect and submit um, samples for avian influenza testing from those birds, and whether or not we would consider doing any sediment testing, um, especially in, say, urban lake areas um, and that sort of thing. 
just to let you know, I am, we are, Arizona is not on the Pacific Flyway. We're kind of on the edge between two flyways. Thank you. Sorry, and I was I was on mute there. So this is Julie Lenock, and um, you know we've um, just established and kind of rolled out the 2011 or sorry 2021 2022 um, surveillance plan, um, both with live bird active surveillance and, and our hunter harvest coming up in the fall. Um, I think a morbidity or mortality event may be handled a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So if there is any of that type of um, activity, just get in touch with us at the National Wildlife Disease Program. And um, I know that um, the National Wildlife Health Center, Han Ip and his team there has done mortality event um, investigations also. So ju just stay tight with us. Um, we don't have any plans right now as far as sediment activity, but um, you know, this information coming in and the um, technology that Chelsea presented is certainly of interest and, in, you know, if we can potentially corroborate on that or, or look at some future activities, I think it's it's an interesting technology and we'll try to see if it's uh, how it pans out and, and what we can determine if it's um, cost effective to do it that way and, and um, how closely those, those match sort of real time information that's coming in from the field. Did you have a second question, Anne? Uh, no, no, Juliana, that um, that was that pretty much covered it. It's just um, usually with the mortality events that we investigate uh, the singles. If we were to ship all of those to USGS for whole bird analysis and and necropsy, I think we would might end up overwhelming them. So that's why I was con asking about potentially collecting samples just for avian influenza testing. Um, Clearly, we really don't have the funds to pay for that individual bird testing, and that's why I was asking for maybe uh, financial assistance on that. And um, I'll, I'll hop in and um, see if uh, Han or someone else from USGS wants to join as well. Um, so our uh, our current our current strategy in the U.S. really hasn't changed. Our, our goal is to get as many um, morbidity mortality events that um, would be subject, su suggestive of a uh, influenza um, uh, pathology to get those tested at the USGS National Wildlife Health Center. Um, and so, excuse me, so that is still our current strategy, especially for large die-offs. So we, we do have an, uh, an interagency protocol that's been in place since, my goodness, Han, it's probably 2005, 2006, where, you know, yep. any of the large die-offs um, uh, samples go directly, what, what, you know, really whether it's suggestive of AI or not, samples go to NWHC mm -hmm. and we get them tested for AI. For the one-offs, um, uh, I think we've been doing pretty well with uh, getting Han and his group up there the morbidity mortality on the one-offs, and they, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for them, but they've been doing a great job at getting those tested for us in a timely manner. So, um, Han, do you want to talk about that a little bit more? So, I think there's there's several things. Um, first, I have a number of reasons. We probably cannot test every single bird around the country um, for everything. However, um, we have a couple of mechanisms that we want to think about. One is to document the mortalities, even if they're singletons, into our open source, um, publicly accessible um, website called Whispers. We'd like all the wildlife mortality events to go in as much as possible. And that gives everybody an idea as to whether there is a pattern that is emerging. And I think that's really important, just to document that we are seeing maybe a little bit more songbird mortality in a particular area. Or, well, look and behold, there is actually a number of different songbird mortality scattered across the Atlantic states kind of thing, right? So 
please, if you're not already using Whispers, um, get an account on Whispers and document these events. Secondly, it is always worth talking to our epidemiologist. Um, they have information from other states and adjacent countries about what else is happening. And they may sort of like have an idea as to one, to give you an idea of what's, what's going, likely going on in your area without testing, but also it helps to inform them of potentially this is the beginning of something that is coming up and we would like to be on top of that. And in those kinds of cases, then singletons become very important. And one of the general guidance, I guess, would be to sort of give us an idea as to what is that, what are you seeing and how is that in your perspective of being the subject matter expert in your area with your animals? Um, is, is this something that is seasonal? Does it typically occur? In this case, we may not sort of do as much testing as we would like to, but if it's something that is unexpected, unusual, it is occurring earlier in the year, later in the year, it is affecting a different class of age class of birds, different species, then that elevates our interest in terms of getting those birds in for testing. Does that make sense? Yes, very much. Thanks, Han, and thank you, Tom, too. Appreciate your um, insight and input. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate the, the questions. Um, let me make sure I'm keeping track of the audio questions as well um, from our event producers. If you do have a question on the audio line, if you could please raise your hand and um, we will be able to unmute you and call on you. And do we have anyone on the audio lines right now? We do. We have one person. Hey, your line's unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Krista Mansfield. I'm the state wildlife veterinarian for Washington State. And Anne just touched on this a little bit, I think, um, and, and there's been a little bit of discussion, but in regards to um, reporting out results, particularly uh, significant results, such as a high uh, um, you know, H5H1 that might be detected in a state, what is the plan for notification of the state wildlife agencies and in particular, um, the staff of the state wildlife agencies. Um, in previous years, uh, these large avian influenza surveillance programs, it seems like there was a lot closer um, coordination with the states and in particular the wildlife health staff of the states. And um, I'm not really, um, it seems a little bit different this year. Um, and so I'm just trying to understand, or maybe I'm just making a request that the wildlife health staff be looped in on what's going on and particularly on any results. Um, that are significant and that might be reported out in the media, for example. Thanks, Kristen. This is Julie, and, and I can handle that one. Um, so, um, as Dr. Wheeler um, mentioned, so of course, the, for the wild bird surveillance, those are handled first at our um, at our um, agreed upon and contracted non lab. Any non-negative um, matrix, so matrix positive H5 or H7s are forwarded to the NBSL for confirmation. We're working on the specifics of that messaging right now and trying to um, streamline that for, for the exact reasons that you're saying that we want that notification um, to get back to us with the National Wildlife Disease Center. And then, of course, to the state animal health officials in the United States and the state um, wildlife agency basically simultaneously. So we're, we're working on trying to streamline that as much as possible. We did have some hiccups as far as um, messaging and everyone getting that. So I appreciate your, your request and your comment and um, certainly want to do everything that we can to make sure that if there is a detection at the state level um, that, we, that we get that information back to you, um, you folks as quickly as possible. So heard loud and clear. Thank you. Yep, and I can go back and make sure that um, um, addressing Kyle's question, I know that was specifically um, to the United States as far as um, what happens with the swabs. Um, Catherine signed in from Canada that all need to swabs in Canada. 
and that the H5 and H7 samples are prioritized. So thanks, Catherine, for that additional information from, from Canada. Okay, um, any further questions on the phone lines right now? We do have another, uh, another caller, one moment. Hey, Mr. Sleeman, your line's unmuted. Great, thank you. So, so I would just like to go back to the sort of previous question about the testing of singleton raptors. And um, Han covered, I think, what I was planning to say uh, um, pretty effectively. Um, we do have, you know, for the National Wildlife Health Center, we do have submission criteria that we, we usually use as a guidance about what we will and will not accept. And, and as you mentioned, Diane, it is a balance between uh, how sensitive we want the system to be uh, with balancing how much resources we have. And we do try and be quite dynamic in, in modifying those submission criteria, depending on a perceived level of risk. So for example, um, you know, back in 2020, we were noticing a large uptick in cases in wild birds in Europe and um, uh, uh, Asia. We sent out a wildlife health bulletin uh, alerting folks to this issue, and, and um, we did actually liberalize our, our, our criteria for submission of mortality uh, samples. So that's, that's one way we handle it. But, uh, but uh, the kind of comment I'd like to add is I think it would be really helpful if we could perhaps become more robust, more scientific, and more systematic in how we assess those risks and how we then sort of modify, ramp up, or ramp down the surveillance that we do based on, on the assessment of the risks, but recognizing there's a, always going to be a fair amount of uncertainty. Um, but again, going back to the, some of the discussions we had yesterday about um, what are the signals that we can potentially track that should alert us to potential high risks? Um, uh, you know, what, what are, you know, would an uptick in, in, in uh, cases in East Asia be sufficient for us to say, oh, we should, we should um, uh, change our surveillance tactics or, or approach? So, so that, that's I think, one thing I think would be good for us to look at, look at is perhaps more robust, more rigorous risk-based approaches to how we, how we ramp up around down surveillance. Over. Thank you. And that was Jonathan Sleeman, of course, chiming in from the National Wildlife Health Center. Jonathan, thanks for that additional information. And yeah, certainly understand the prioritization. Um, just reading a comment coming in from Craig Steven that the timeliness isn't um, from the time being sampled, being identified, it's all of the process in the middle. Um, the birds being detected, first level diagnostics being done, confirmation, result communication, and then action. And the delays there um, up to 16 weeks in, in past um, conditions. So agree, and, and I think um, both in the United States and in Canada, um, everyone is, is recognizing that that's just just too long, and that we'll do what we can to um, improve that and, and really um, minimize those delays and try to make sure that communication is happening as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, we still need the laboratory confirmation and making sure that the appropriate folks are notified sooner, but, but 16 weeks likely is not an acceptable time frame. Agree with that. Okay, anyone else on the phone line? Yes, we do have another question from Lisa. I'll unmute your line. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Lisa Schender. Um, I have a question about testing of birds that go through wildlife rehabilitation centers. And I'm wondering if there are any plans um, with USDA APHIS to increase collaboration maybe with wildlife rehabilitation centers, especially during times when you're seeing these peaks in H5 in wild birds. Um, oftentimes, wildlife rehabilitation centers receive neurological raptors that may test negative for West Nile virus. And unfortunately, by the time these birds die, um, they've usually been in the center and received, you know, different sorts of therapeutics and are no longer eligible to be sent to the National Wildlife Health Center for testing. Thanks. Um, Han or Jonathan, do you want to take that one? Yes, so it's Jonathan here. Um, so we certainly, we, we have, and we do take samples from wildlife rehabilitation uh, facilities and, and, and individuals. We always seek concurrence from the, the state wildlife agency before we accept those samples. Um, and we have certainly, 
detected some important diseases through through that wildlife rehabilitation um, route. So, we, so, it, so it is possible. Uh, it just has to be coordinated with the, with the state agency that obviously permits um, the, the, those wildlife rehabilitation activities. You did point on some of the challenges that we have when we do get samples from wildlife uh, rehabilitators in that if they've been in captivity for a significant period of time, um, could, they have, could they have contracted a, you know, a, a disease or a disease during that, that time? Would therapeutics mask a potential, potential disease? So there's, there are some complications we have to work through. But, but it is a source of samples. It can be a very important source of samples. Um, and it's certainly something we should consider uh, in the future. Thanks. Lisa, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, in part, I was just wondering uh, more if, if there would be, um, I guess, more of a program or messaging to wildlife rehabilitation centers when there's um, noted to be a higher activity, like uh, Dr. Gilberto was talking about the peaks and troughs in the H5 detections, and if when that that would be something where there might be uh, more notifications sent out to wildlife rehabilitators for a more coordinated sampling through those centers. Yeah, Lisa, that's a, that's a, that's a great that's a great point, and and I think um, we've learned some lessons from our response with. Uh, you know, COVID-19 and concerns about wildlife exposure to SARS-CoV-2, and in particular, you know, wildlife rehabilitation settings, whether it's close human or wildlife contact. And as you know, we, we work very closely with the rehabilitation community to, to develop guidelines um, to mitigate those risks. I know it's a slightly different topic, but I, I, my point is I think it was a good model um, for how to work with that, 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 that community on a particular disease issue. And I think we can potentially look at doing something similar uh, for high path AI, uh, either to alert them about these issues, but also potentially to rec recruit them as a sort of samples. Again, uh, I think this needs to be done with the concurrence of the permitting agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the state wildlife agencies, to make sure communications aren't getting cross crosswise. But, but I, I, I think you've, I think point well made and something we, we should look at in the future as an outreach strategy. Thanks. Um, this is Russ. I think just to go back to Aki Jonathan's point, I can't think of a faster way for a federal agency to get crosswise with the states uh, than to unilaterally send anything to a constituent in a state. And so it would be, once again, really important to develop uh, a coordinated framework so you're, you're not ever reaching out to a rehabilitator except through the state agency. Uh, that also ties the state agency to the national, uh, to, to the health center. Excellent point, Russ, and, and appreciate your your thoughts there. I'll pause for a second, make sure we've got that that topic addressed. Okay, if I can go back, um, Chelsea, if you're still available, um, and I know Han and um, Kevin have both both chimed in. So, um, question from Han. To Chelsea, if the environmental RNA is not persisting between collection, how does that explain their subsequent detection in wild birds? And then um, Kevin um, Kuczynski um, did write a note about um, possibility that we may have some um, uh, water, some big se seasonality and salinity pH changes in the raining season that maybe cause some disruption in the water. Your, your influenza soup that you mentioned and whether the sediment stirs that up and diving ducks might have more accessibility to it. So, Chelsea, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And certainly, Kevin and Han, if I've misrepresented your thoughts, please chime in. Oh, Chelsea, you're muted. No audio yet, Chelsea. There you go. I think you had to unmute me. <laughs> I was like, I am unmuted. I'm trying to talk. My husband wishes he had that button. <laughs> You're muted. You're muted. Um, I, I made a cheeky comment to Andy that about that it's all his fault because I think 
I don't think the birds are becoming infected in the Fraser Valley. Probably what's happening is, and it ties in great with what uh, Dr. DiLiberto is saying about these like peaks and troughs and changes in prevalence is probably one year the birds have it. It's at a low prevalence. They all come into the Fraser Valley. And just by like probability, we're probabilistically unlikely to, uh, less likely to capture that bird with the low prevalence AI than we are to find it in sediment, which seems less sensitive or more sensitive. And then they all go back up, up to Alaska where, where Andy lives, and then probably the, the prevalence starts going up. Um, and, and Sam Lysette ha, has done some great phylogynamic modeling about the changes in, in prevalence subtypes, and then, and then they come back down and it's at a higher prevalence, so then we actually detect it in the birds. That's our, our hypothesis. Um, I mean, the, what we would be more worried about is if we were finding it in the birds, and then if the reverse was true, if we like found it in the birds and, that, and the sediment, and then it's no longer in the birds, but it like keeps being in the sediment month after month after month. And then we're like, oh, okay, this is just a carryover. But the the reverse is uh, is really fascinating, but less indicative of, of maybe like just long term persistence of that same RNA in the environment. Um, but like I said, it's so hard to 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 model in the lab. So our goal is ultimately to pilot these. In, in parallel pilot sediment in parallel with live trapping and hunter killed over time so we can actually start to get a better handle on the dynamics. I hope that makes sense. I like that. Thank you. You like that. <laughs> Dr. Ip, Dr. Kaczynski, did that answer did that answer answer your concern? Yes. Very good. Thanks, Chelsea. And uh, I, I know this came up when um, Johannes was speaking as well, and, and um, we touched on it yesterday. And of course, there are no clear-cut answers, but um, one of his slides talked about um, whether um, the weather and um, potentially having that high rainfall year in 2014, 2015, and then some freezing conditions caused, caused the birds to congregate, which could have led to, to risk there. Um, I think Chelsea understanding kind of the environmental and um, climate change concerns with what you might be looking at for environmental persistence of the RNA and, and looking at these watersheds. And um, we've alluded to it a couple of times, you know, we've got severe drought conditions in the Western United States right now. And um, I'm sitting under a hazy um, wild, wild um, fire kind of smoke filled sky in Colorado right now from our western wildfires and, and we know that even just bird sampling may be a challenge this year because of um, you, you know the decreased water in some of the watersheds and, and the birds not being where we think they're going to be so um, climate change is a whole nother monster that we can layer on top of these challenges with wild bird surveillance so not a quick answer I know but just to throw out one more thing for us to worry about in our, in our conversations um, I do have another comment from Victoria. I'm um, going back to Lisa's question as far as um, using um, uh, rehab birds as far as a, a sentinel or making sure that we're including them in detection. And her comment is actually quite interesting. In British Columbia, we avoid testing in rehabbers since there's a concern about a DPOP if there's a notifiable avian influenza detection. So yeah, some of those birds sit there for quite a while in those rehabilitation facilities, and, and that may be a consequence of that is if we do um, submit those samples um, in the surveillance stream and there is a detection, what does that mean and, and what potentially would happen if the, entire, um, if the entire facility was depopulated or something of the nature? So um, Victoria, I don't know if you've got an open phone line, but excellent um, comments and additional consideration there. Okay, do I have anyone else on the phone line coming in with um, questions or comments? Just a reminder, you can use the raise hand icon in the lower right of the panelist tab. We currently have no one with their hand raised. 
okay. I'll watch the chat for just a moment, but um, certainly want to thank all of our excellent speakers today. So today's um, focus, of course, was was really gleaning what we've learned um, from that 2014-2015 outbreak. Um, of course, great consequence to the poultry industry in the United States and Canada, and appreciate the information from both USDA and USGS, and then our Canadian colleagues, Canadian Food Inspection Agency and Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. Um, fantastic information and really gives us some, some tools and some things to build on um, understanding what we're going to do to ramp up our surveillance, both in Canada and in the United States this year, how to improve our messaging and the timeliness of those messaging, if there is a detection and, and who that information is shared with and, and how quickly hear the request from both sides of the border to, to speed that process up. Um, excellent information from Chelsea Hemsworth on new environmental tools and, and potentially using that as a, as a um, you know, another tool in our arsenal going forward. So appreciate everyone's time and information today. Um, tomorrow, session three, we're moving forward and going into um, challenges and opportunities and have another um, whole day of speakers. And Dr. Samantha Gibbs will be um, the moderator for tomorrow's session. So I'll pause for just a second and see if we have any last minute questions and um, otherwise we'll wrap up and make sure that um, everyone has a little bit of time to take a break before your next meetings and we'll see everybody back tomorrow.